Good morning. Welcome to the Minneapolis Institute of Art and the Friends Lecture Series. So happy to see many um, art and floral lovers here. So thank you for coming. My name is Barbara Proschel and I'm the president of the Friends. Um, today, and now that spring is here, everything is coming up art in bloom. So we are going to have a panel of pedestal floral artists affectionately known as PFAs, who will be um, sharing their inspirations, their processes and objectives as they create their floral art. Now remember the PFAs are the reason that Mia is filled with amazing and gorgeous artful flowers during Art in Bloom. But before we get started, I would like to give a short word from our sponsor. Hey, this lecture is presented by the Friends of the Institute with generous support from the Mark and Mary Goff Bitterman Fund. And I'll just note some of our upcoming Friends events. Um, on April 19th and May 17th, we have the Friends Book Club. And if you'll remember, our book clubs um, involve not just spirited discussion, but a guided tour of related art objects um, in the Mia collection. And then on April 25th through 28th, our much awaited Art in Bloom. It's our 40th year. Yay. Yeah. So uh, besides the uh, breathtaking floral art, gonna, we will also have uh, many events to learn and have fun. We have two artist talks, workshop, workshops, a not to be missed gala, a family event on Sunday. So lots of things to take part in besides walking around and seeing all the beautiful flowers and art. For more information and tickets for the ticketed events, please go to the MIA website at artsmia.org. And then lastly, but not least, on May 19th, we will have a lecture at 1 p.m. on Sunday from Patricia Michaels. She is a she is a, an awarded uh, fashion designer. And the lecture will be followed by a fashion exhibition and a ticketed reception. The title of Patricia's talk is 40 Years of Water Lily. So if you wanna know what that means, please join us on May 19th. All right, so um, before the panel, I'm going to um, introduce our 2024 Art in Bloom co-chairs, Barb Champ and Diane Morrison. So um, just to say that Diane and Barb have been working hard all year and they're going to give you a peek behind the scenes of what it takes to put on this amazing four day event. So help me in welcoming Diane and Barb. Thanks, Barbara. So I'm Diane. Anyway, I'm going to just kind of give you a little bit of an overview of, of the floral artist kind of process. And then Julie will come up and talk with a few of our floral artists. Um, we have two classifications of floral artists during Art and Bloom. One is, one are, one is the, uh, the commercial florists. So those are professional florists, have their own businesses, and they are, for Art and Bloom this year, are going to be interpreting It's a Delicate Balance, which is our signature piece for Art and Bloom by Christy Belcourt, who will also be one of our speakers during Art and Bloom. So she's a living artist, and it's a really wonderful piece. So all of our commercial floral artists will be interpreting that same piece of work and it's kind of spread throughout more open areas in the museum. Our pedestal floral artists, seven of which are here, 
are the um, artists who are matched one-on-one -on -one with a piece of art and they interpret that single piece of art um, individually or with in small partner kind of jointly together. Um, so that's that. Anyway, our Art and Bloom is very unique. Our Art and Bloom is one of the largest, I think it's the second largest in the country. And um, we are one of the probably only Art and Blooms that doesn't vet their floral artists. So our floral artists are um, anybody. You Anybody here could be, a, <clears throat> excuse me, a floral artist. We have a, a process of just registering people, whoever's interested. We've got a database of, of floral artists from current and past years that we use when we go into next year and then add anybody that's interested, that's expressed an interest during Art and Bloom or after that. Um, we add them to the list and then we reg you register um, as a PFA and then there's a process beyond that. But if you're interested and you think this sounds like a fun thing, you are welcome to join us. So that's a, a unique kind of thing about our, our Art and Bloom. And I think it gives us a really interesting mix of floral artists as a result. For instance, this year we have 214 pedestal floral artists and 45 of them out of the 214 are first time artists, first time floral artists, which is just, it's really fun to, to see them. Some of these people here are, are second time floral artists so, so they can kind of tell you what it was like as, the, as a first time thing. So you don't need years and years of experience, although we do have some people with years and years of experience. We have two people that have actually participated in Art and Bloom as pedestal floral artists for 40 years. And one of them is on the stage here today and I'm sure that's Sue Bag Boggy who will um, be speaking to you later. Yeah, um, we also have about 20, um, so we have 26 floral artists that have had over 15 years of experience and then another 55 with like five to 10 years. So it's a real, it's a broad mix of experienced and less experienced people. Um, but they all come up with amazing, because they give a lot of thought to this, they come up with amazingly beautiful um, interpretations of the works of art in the museum. Okay, so let's see. So the process, the process of, of um, kind of who's gonna be a pedestal artist is planning begins in the, in the fall. We choose a, a signature piece, we choose committee chairs, and then um, we start reaching out to this group of our database. I think we had, I think we sent out maybe 350, 400 um, emails to, to people just to see if they wanted to join us. And then it goes through a registration path. P people register. And then we kind of so narrow that 400 down to, I think this year it was around 250 or 270, something like that people. Um, so that's the registration process. And then the, um, so, so we've got that pool of people. Then we have the MIA curators who decide which works of art are going to be available for, for Art and Bloom. And so we, we get that number and they, they make their decision. Some, some of it's a bit of a mystery, but they some of the idea, but it adds to the intrigue, all good. But uh, so they, they want to make sure that the art is spread throughout the, the museum. They want to make sure that traffic flow is good. So they don't want things clogged up in... It, because you know that the crowds that come through Art and Bloom um, during the weekend are tremendous. And so they want to make sure that traffic safety, safety of the art, safety of the people coming through um, is maintained. And so uh, they choose works of art. This year we had a hundred and I think we were given 178 pieces of art to, to that our pedestal floral artists could cho choose from. Um, and and that so that becomes our one of our parameters in terms of how many pedestal floral artists we can have. Another one of our pedestal uh, one of our, our parameters is that we have a certain number of pedestals for those people. To, so you know we can't have three hundred people when we don't have three hundred pedestals, for instance. Um, and then the the third um, um, limiting factor is how many people actually register. 
Last year, we had a lot of people register. We had very few pieces of art, so we had to cut a lot of people. But everybody who doesn't get doesn't get into that that pool is put on a waiting list. And some people end up partnering up. Other people end up um, getting in just because people drop out inevitably. You know, somebody gets sick, something happens, life life go, life happens. And, and so they're able to get in that way. This year, most of the people, I think we've only got five people still waiting on our waiting list. So most of the people that were kind of on the waiting list have gotten in one way or another, which I mean, it's, it's really nice. We don't wanna cut anybody off, especially when we have this open atmosphere for, we want everybody to participate. We hate to say, you know, there are 50 people that wanna be on, on this, uh, this panel of, of floral artists that can't. So um, anyway, let's see, what else? Uh, there are also, the, the PFAs have to follow guidelines and rules uh, for participating because this is a big privilege to be in a museum like this. The art around every corner in every gallery is priceless. And so we wanna make sure that the art is protected and that uh, people keep their distance from the art, the flowers are kept, a distance from the art, 12 inches is, we, we can't have anything closer than that. We don't touch the art, we don't touch the frames, anything like that. Um, it, some of the other rules are when flowers come into the museum, we make sure that the pedestal floral artists and, and all the floral artists remove the um, stamens and the pollen from it because you know, if you ever have flowers in your house, they can make a huge mess and we don't want the artwork damaged in any way from the mess that that makes. So throughout Art and Bloom, we have people going through and pulling off, pulling off stamens and making sure that the, the art is clean or the flowers are clean of, of those kinds of damaging things. Um, some of the other things, this is a very dry environment and a very warm environment. So it really isn't conducive to fresh flowers. Um, so, Obviously, our floral artists have to water their their flowers, and they have to be very careful because we don't want spills. We don't want any standing water, and so there are rules against standing water. There are rules against everybody has to come in with their water bottles covered, and they can water no misting, anything like that. So, I mean, there are, are a lot of rules, and again, most of them, all of them, are to protect the art and to protect the the people that are coming through too. Things like um, we can't have any loose rocks, marbles, anything that could be, you know, picked up and thrown around or messed up. Um, no, no loose dirt. Uh, no soil. It's all fresh flowers. In fact. 90% of the floral display is supposed to either be natural materials or fresh fresh flowers. I don't know I don't know how you actually judge that but you know you can I guess. Um, and and then so no artificial materials like um, plastic no plastic flowers or silk flowers or anything like that. Let's see, what else do we have? Just a, a few more things. Setup day is the day before Art and Bloom begins. It's on Wednesday this year. Um, the, the 24th. And it is, it is such a wonderful, wonderful flurry of activity. You see this museum, people come in with all these flowers. It goes from this stately museum, you know, very kind of highbrow to a beautiful flourish of spring. It just transitions from, from this to just blossoming. And it's so much fun. Everybody has a good time during, I think, during, during the setup. And this year we're going to have in Don setup day, we'll have our 214 PFAs, 30 CFAs, 38 volunteers, probably representatives from the press, and thousands of flowers that will come in to make this museum even more beautiful than it already is. Um, it's, it's a heartfelt and joyful experience for all of our floral artists. And it's just a wonderful transition. It's a magical time. So I, I, I encourage our PFAs to experience the joy of Art and Bloom. I encourage all of you to experience the joy of Art and Bloom. And um, it really is a wonderful, wonderful time in the museum. So I want to introduce Julie now, who's our moderator for today. And she will be talking with our PFA representatives. Thank you.
Hello. Um, I am going to introduce these uh, seven wonderful pedestal floral artists and um, ask them a couple questions and then open this up to all of you where you can ask them questions as well. By the way, thank you everyone um, for coming today. Um, I'm not a competitive person by nature, but I Art and Bloom started in 1981 at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. And I like to check back there every once in a while and see what's going on. They're having Art and Bloom the same weekend this year that we are. And um, I think ours is the best Art and Bloom for all the reasons that Diane mentioned. I mean, it's truly community driven. I mean, it's, it is planned and presented by volunteers. Any of you can become a friend and um, help us plan it. And all of our exhibitors are community members. Um, we have, there are no barriers to entry. And um, of course it's free and open to the public. Um, but anyway, so I checked back and, and Diane said, we're the second largest. There are art and blooms all over the United States and Canada. Who is larger than Mia? New York, okay. Well, Boston this year has 45 floral exhibitions and we have 168. 168, so we're much larger. We've outgrown Boston. <laughs> um, okay, so I would like to get to the panelists. Um, Amanda Luke. Okay. Um, and um, oh, I'm supposed to put the pictures up here, I guess. Is that right? Okay, am I doing this? Which am I going the right direction? Here we go. Okay, Amanda Luke. Okay. Yes, Amanda. This is Amanda's. Yeah, this is Amanda's second year. So that this is actually your first year arrangement. She is not a professional florist, um, but she has done some flower arranging in her uh, life as an event planner. Her artwork up here is portrait of Mademoiselle Dubois painted in 1884. Amanda, this is a very romantic scene. What design elements in this painting were most important to you when making your elegant floral arrangement? Yeah, so um, like you said, I am in my second year of doing this. So when I got this piece, when we were given a list to choose from of pieces, I looked at it and I said, which one has flowers so I can take it really literally? <laughs> And I found this one and I was really inspired by obviously the general shape of the flowers that she's holding. Um, and I really wanted to pull in a lot of the color very literally, the floral sweep across the front from the bouquet that she's holding as well. Um, the vase, which I made myself by gluing two vases together. So <laughs> gotta get really creative sometimes to make some of these work. Um, but yeah, it was definitely for me just pulling form together and looking at the shape of the figure in the image and kind of translating that into florals. I think, you know, for this year, as I think about it more, I want to explore doing something a little less literal because I feel like in my mind, it, it was such a challenge to do this because I am not a professional florist. I probably couldn't even name half of these flowers. I just like flowers and I like art. Um, so for me, it's always very easy to just um, go literal with it and see, I see a face. So I'm going to do tan colored flowers that are face colored flowers. Um, and I think there's an added challenge to the people who go with really abstract designs and do something that pulls smaller details. Um, so I'm really excited to, you know, keep growing and learning in this process. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Amanda, I was noticing a strong diagonal in, yeah. in your arrangement, and I see that in her flowers. And the color of your vase, you match that perfectly to her skirt. That, that's just fantastic. That was a very lucky happenstance, in case anyone is wondering. <laughs> that, uh, that cheap $20 vase from Bachman's that I glued together the night before really... Um, <laughs> really, really worked. So thank you. Thank you, Amanda. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, Amy. Okay. Amy Kubis. This is this is Amy's seventh year. Amy is neither a professional florist nor a hobbyist. Mm -hmm. And she only buys flowers for her art and bloom arrangements. Oh yes, I need to move. I hope I go the right direction. Yes, I did. 
Okay. Um, and Amy, you hit this one out of the park, I think. Um, her artwork is a 19th century wooden door from East Africa's Swahili coast. Amy, what aspect of this door inspired you to make this very sophisticated arrangement? Yeah, with this one, um, I tried to look a little more into the history behind where the door would have been located, what it would have symbolized. Um, this particular door would have been on a home in a port city where it would have been someone who was well-renowned in business. Um, it could have been someone who was known very religiously, um, someone who had like a lot of economical stature in that port city. So I wanted to take inspiration from flowers that would have been more native to Africa um, and really kind of resemble the, or like emulate the vibrancy of a port city at that time. Um, so a lot of the flowers that I chose um, were very tropical in nature. Um, they were also very hardy. They would have grown in environments um, either in Africa or in neighboring areas. So they really held up very well in the museum environment in such a dry and um, warm environment. So it didn't require too much maintenance, thankfully, over the course of the five days. Um, but it was, I think, a very... That year, we happened to have a, a wild blizzard that came in on opening night. Um, so I think it was just a very well-received spring reprieve. <laughs> yes. Amy, I, um, you know, the door is strong and sturdy. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that your plant materials are, they're stout and strong mm -hmm. as well. They're not frail flowers. Mm -hmm. I think that works so perfectly. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you, Amy. Oh, Amy, I was going to ask you a question. So you just do, you only buy flowers. You just, do you do a practice arrangement before you bring this in? I do typically, just because I'm so unfamiliar with um, florals and the size and how hardy or delicate they'll be. I do tend to do a practice arrangement um, just so I know exactly the size of the flower and how much that would take to fill the space that I'm hoping to arrange in. So I do typically do. Okay, thank you, Amy. <laughs> Okay. Hi. Janae Murphy. Yes. Um, this is Janae's second year. Okay. Yes. Let me get to the slide. Oh, oh yes. This was so uh, beautiful, Janae. Thank this you. is Janae's second year. Her artwork is a sterling silver after dinner coffee pot mm -hmm. made by Gorham in 1891. Mm -hmm. Janae, this is such a fetching arrangement and so Thank you. dainty. Thank you. Um, can you tell me which design elements in the coffee pot were your inspiration? Yeah, so uh, one of the things that I was most drawn to was the beautiful lines that are in the coffee pot, the very uh, slender spout and handle, as well as the, I would find, more unusual shape of the coffee pot because it's a Turkish style uh, after dinner coffee pot. Um, and so I chose uh, I chose uh, a silver uh, Victorian vase, which is a vase uh, created around the same time or that would have been used in homes about the same time as the coffee pot's creation. And I used... Uh, bear grass and English ivy to uh, kind of represent the handle and a seeded eucalyptus for the spout. And um, to, for, I really wanted to really capture kind of the uh, beautiful motifs that's on there. So I wanted to keep everything really soft in contrast with those motifs. So a few well, different things. It's lovely. It's, it's spare and it's airy yeah. and, um, I, I think it's really beautiful. Do you, do you do sketches before you start? I do. I do. Um, I, uh, when I pick my, when I get my piece, um, I sit and try to come up with an idea of how I want it to look. And then I go and find a vase to match or to fit the sketch after that. And, uh, yeah, I just keep sketching and changing and things like that. But I prior to this, no, 
Same with Amy, no floral experience prior to, other than just gardening with my mom growing up with some annuals. So. <laughs> Good for you. That's that's great. Thank you, Janae. Thank you. Okay. Kat Hansen. This is Kat's 18th year. Kat grew up on a farm in North Dakota where she developed a love of gardening. And as a member of a local garden club, she has taken floral design classes. Um, the painting Kat has here is by Max Peckstein. It's titled Stormy Sea, painted in 1921. And um, Max Peckstein was painting between the World Wars, between World War I and World War II. And um, the Nazis labeled his artwork degenerate, um, and it was seized by the Nazis during World War II. Um, anyway, Kat, this is, is so beautiful, um, and I can see that color is very important to you. Um, so, and hydrangeas, you're using hydrangeas, and they are famously temperamental and collapse in warm air. So can you talk about how, <laughs> what inspired you and how you kept them alive in the, in the very, <laughs> it's hot and warm on the third floor of Mia. Who told you about that? <laughs> I, I put this arrangement together, went to bed the next morning. They were, and uh, conditioning your flowers is a very important thing to know. So I pulled all the hydrangeas out. I put them in my kitchen sink and I let them soak. And after a few hours, they cheered up again. But um, yeah, I love the the colors in this painting. Um, I love the the motion, the 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 storminess. I mean, like for the white caps, I've used rice flowers, which are the little white balls on the bottom there and all over. And I wanted to add more drama. So I'm using the sea holly. So this is my um, art collect. This is my artwork for this year. This is what I would consider my practice piece, and it's a good thing I practice. Like I said, I come wake up in the next morning and it's uh, not happy. So um, yeah, this was we get a selection. It wasn't my first selection but it actually was close to my last selection. But when I saw it in person, I, I just felt the storminess and the unrest of the sea. So that's what I tried to represent. Thank you, Kat. Okay, Mary Ann Morgan. Mary, I'm not good at this. Here I go again. Okay. <laughs> okay, this is Mary Ann's eighth year. Mary Ann is a part time florist who works in the bridal business. She's also a multimedia artist with art displayed in the Northrop King building. Her artwork is a dramatic painting by Georgia O'Keeffe titled City Night and painted in 1926. Mary Ann, Mary Ann, your vessel is so special. The importance of containers cannot be overstated. Can you share some information about your vessel? Yes, it's uh, made out of fused glass, which is like stained glass, only you cook it in the kiln and it melts together. And this was done tall and narrow because the painting lines were tall and narrow. And when I saw this in the selection process, it was a black and white photo. And I thought, wow, that's very dramatic lines. I really like dramatic art. So um, the guidelines had said uh, your vessels are very important. And so I started my first year with an uh, African beaded mask made out of fused glass. Um, this one was tall and narrow, had the dramatic lines, the black, the iridescent, the, the flowers are representing the same thing. The gladiolas opened up more during the week. And so they did represent more 
white going up through the middle. But um, so uh, life does happen. I've done this for eight years, but life happens. And so this year, my daughter, Stacy, is assisting me <laughs> for the first time. Um, we'll, ha we'll have a piece over in 377. Um, I just like the dramatic pieces, the abstracts. Um, I did do um, the Oriental Armor and Helmet piece, and that won an award, and this one won an award back when we did those. That's great. This is very sophisticated. Thank you, yeah, Kat. Thank you. <laughs> Sarah Wall Hari. Correct. Wall Hari. Wall Hari. Okay, <laughs> this is Sarah's second year. And Sarah is a professional florist working with Bachman's. And by the way, Bachman's is our um, lead sponsor for Art and Bloom. Um, oh. And um, for her art piece, Sarah chose a 20th century wooden ritual pole from Indonesia. Sarah, what was it about this piece of art that inspired you? Um, well, first, my I want to say my selection for this art piece, I had gone through and put in like 10, 15 choices. And then I went through the list one more time. I'm like, I just want to see if there's anything that really stands out to me that I missed. And this one stood out because of how big it was. I was like, okay, if I have this giant piece in the museum, everyone will see my piece. So I was very <laughs> excited about that. <laughs> so I actually moved it up to my um, third on the list and I got it and I was just so excited. Um, and then I was time to decide what I was gonna do. And I was like, okay, well, first of all, there's no color whatsoever. So a lot of people, I think, choose art pieces that have a lot of color, um, just so you can bring out the beauty. But with this, I could, you know, I could have done some color, but I was like, I really want to do more of the shapes. So I really paid attention to, um, in the Ritual Biz poll, there's three men stacked on top of each other. So I used the white protea to kind of represent the heads of each um each person on the pole and then very straight and tall, you know, so I didn't want to bring out, I was able to use Oasis in the container, which really helped with the structural point. You know, when you use water in a container, you just never know if everything's going to stay where you want it. It's going to shift and moving um, just overall over time. If something is starting to droop, it might bring down the rest. So I was able to use Oasis in it and um, which really helped keep it together. And a lot of the tropicals too, you know, they do last a lot longer in the museum because it is really warm. You know, I was shocked because this was actually my first year and I came in and I was just sweating from like walking around, looking at everything. And I was like, oh my gosh. So I was really thankful that I used the tropicals and yeah, it was fun. I just had an absolute blast. I just, you know, really lucky to be part of Art and Bloom. Sarah, um, like, you know, like the door, your piece and your plant materials are sturdy in contrast to the coffee pot, the wispy plants. I think that works so well with this sculpture. Yes, Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sue Boggy. Um, okay, Sue is a rock star. Yes. <laughs> Sue has participated in all 40 of Mia's Art and Blooms. Sue is the... Sue is a certified instructor and lecturer in Ikebana, the centuries old Japanese art of flower arranging. She is also a semi-retired landscaper and horticulturalist. Sue, um, it, this is beautiful, and I, it's, I cannot see your artwork back there very well, but I have a question. Have you used Ikebana in all 40 of your uh, Art and Bloom designs? 
That's very difficult for me to answer because for seven years or many years, um, I did five arrangements. It was before it was opened up to so many others. And one year I even did seven when the bonsai people retracted two of their bonsai a month or two before. So I've just done many, many. And um, I would say my work is always influenced by Ichabon. So do you, can you use Ikebana or have you used that in interpreting Western art? I have, I've been in other galleries too. Um, sometimes I have worked in the last several years with two of my sons and one is a metal worker and the other one is a potter. And the potter is the one that did the, the vase here for my arrangement. So I work with them and what they like to do. And um, often is sculpture or, or something with more meaning for them. So it's more of a challenge for me. And I think it's a real honor to have to co-create with my own sons or with other potters that I've done over the years. And this space especially is, um, <clears throat> very interesting and for the first time in 40 or 39 years I, I stayed every day and worked with the public um, looking at my arrangements and explaining more to them and I found it just fascinating and in this space um, <clears throat> it is like the mountain the work that you're not seeing that I interpreted was Cypress at Jade Mountain so I did research on it first and when I found out that Cyprus can live a thousand years or more, I wanted to celebrate that fact. So I'm working with the mountain idea with the vase and um, the lines on it and different things. But I like to learn when I'm doing Art and Bloom too. And even with my sons, um, when I was showing the vase to the public, I saw that he did his four lines on it with little circles on top. And that represents his four sons, his four brothers. And as I looked at it more and more, I realized he's the fourth son too. So he had his own signature on his face um, that we were using that day. And then I used flowers in celebration because it was a black and white line drawing of the cypress tree. And I chose the um, Gloriosa lilies because they climb. And um, <clears throat> we were asked a little bit, what was our oops? Well, I did an arrangement on Tuesday night and at midnight I was reading the rules and I thought my base and my branch was too strong for what they were requesting. So I did this arrangement in the next morning over again to um, comply with the rules. And with the Gloriosa lilies, we had to cut the <clears throat> stamens or the anthers off from them plus the pollen. And that's one of the um, beauties of the Gloriosa lily is seeing those um, stamens go out to the other side. and. I really had to struggle with doing that. But the Gloriosa lily can climb, and um, <clears throat> that's why I got it. And when I was bringing the materials home the day before to condition them, <clears throat> the Gloriosa lily was trying to attach to the Oncidium orchids. So what I saw and could show the public is on their lens, shaped leaves, they make a tendril at the end of it. And that's how they attach to something else. And the red color is in China, their national color. And it's their um, meaning for celebration among many other things. And the Oncidium orchids are also known as dancing lady or orchids in China. But the yellow color is for royalty. And I wanted to add the color for celebration with the cypress. And then that evergreen material there is camisiparis, which I grow, so I conditioned it good, made sure it didn't bring in bugs. But that's from the cypress family too. And green is for health and healing. So it added the more meaning to the arrangement itself. 
Thank you, Sue. This is, it's stunning. And um, you have so much knowledge. I, I love hearing your stories. Um, can you tell us um, what brings you back to Art and Bloom again and again now for your 40th year? Well, I was very fortunate to have my first two years with Rosella Pfefferkorn, and um, we met in the Dahlia Society, so we formed a friendship over the years. But she set a good standard for me. And what I really enjoy and have done it is I like to see the dialogue that's produced by people when they look at our artwork and look at the arrangement and to see why we did it. And one time when I was in Japan <clears throat> taking a workshop, they had us walk around and see if people were able to interpret what they started out to do. It wasn't to judge them. It was to see if they were successful in doing that. And that's part of my challenge too. Can I do something that challenges the public a little bit more to look at the artwork and to look at what I'm doing? But can I also do that successfully? And it, it is a challenge, and I like the challenge to do that. Thank you, Sue. There are so many things we can learn from our panelists that um, I'm now opening up uh, the discussion so that the audience can ask questions. Um, and there are people that can give you a microphone, I see hands coming up right now. Um, is someone bringing a microphone or a couple hands up in the second row? This is really a wonderful, wonderful opportunity for all of us to, to hear the, the hard work and the insights that you bring to art. But what I want, I have a question. Uh, this, this is the friends put on this, this whole program. Plus, we pick the art that we focus on, which is the one art piece. This year, it's Christy Belcourt's, it's a delicate balance. And Barb and Diane and I approved that and then worked with the MIA staff to get that. Do you, as a, as a PFA, do you adopt any of the themes in the piece that we pick for our theme? In other words, we've got a piece that's by a live artist, <laughs> a woman, indigenous, environmental, and then she bridges Ojibwe history. She, they used beads a hundred years ago, and she uses dots to call back to the beads. Do, you, do any of those things, do you pay any attention or use in any way the piece we pick for our theme? Does anyone want to answer that question up here? I mean, have you been influenced in any way by our signature art piece? Raise your hand if you have. <laughs> okay, okay. here's your answer. Yes. <laughs> may I say something though? Um, we live on the northwest corner of Prior Lake, and we have the casinos and the tribe right around us. And I've been exposed to some of the things they do and how they react to the flowers and use that and medicinally too. So I'm very curious. And when I have more time, I really would like to study more that is in that painting because it is quite beautiful. And there are many things there that aren't just evident right on the surface. There's going to be a lot to really enjoy and look into. Okay, great. I saw another hand up. I got it here. Kat, I got a question for you. Did you make your own vase? No. Okay. Any other? Okay, there's a question in the third row. Um, I just have a question. I'm going to be a second year PFA, and I think the thing I struggle with the most, yeah. the thing I struggle with the most is just choosing 
the florals. Um, I know you can't have pollen, stamen. So I try to stay away from flowers like that because I'm just I just get nervous about taking it out and make sure making sure it's not there. So what advice would you give for um, newer people who are into the PFA world and just choosing florals that kind of are unique to the design? Um, I must um, suggest that I go to Bachman's on Lindale and their floral designers there are very, very helpful. And I've already pre-ordered my flowers through Bachman's. When I did that, the um, person that orders the flowers said that she couldn't guarantee a certain type of flower that I wanted. So I know that I have to go someplace other than Bachman's, which I hate to punch, you know, I mean, <clears throat> Trader Joe's has really good flowers and they last a long time. <laughs> I swear to it. <laughs> um. <laughs> So for myself, because I grew up gardening with my mom, uh, just annuals out in the front yard, I've always had a fascination with flowers. So I do have a little, just a little bit of a background there, but it was always like petunias, snapdragons, marigolds. My mom had very specific flowers that she planted in very specific ways in her two garden beds, um, but I still enjoyed it. It was always something I looked forward to with my mom, but for myself, um, I would say I started with having an idea of like the feeling I wanted the flowers to have. So for me, I, for my piece last year, I did tulips and originally I had hydrangeas, similar situation, tried to revive them in the sink, didn't work two days before the show and uh, before setup day. And everything died and I panicked and I went to Come Foods and, <laughs> and I bought a bunch of white tulips um, to use. And they actually held all the way to the third day, which then I replaced with white mums because the white football mums were able to get volume. But I really was looking for the texture. So looking for like soft white flowers and then looking at those and sticking with things like mums, roses, really, or tropicals. Those are things that are really going to hold up well in the museum um, because I had already been to the museum and kind of know the temperature of the museum. I had a pretty good idea of what I wanted to do. I also um, previously used to be a dog groomer and one of my clients that I actually buy my flowers from is a florist. She owns a uh, main floral in Anoka. Uh, her name's Dawn and she's amazing. Um, she took me through and always takes me in the back, walks me through and I give her kind of a feeling, my sketch that I do of my floral arrangement of kind of what I'm wanting. And because I'm not as knowledgeable as some of the other panelists here, um, really just taking the time to learn what she has to give me for knowledge. So really kind of partnering up, partnering up with a local florist and just kind of learning from them and just talking to them, spending an afternoon. Uh, and, you know, you might want to do earlier in the week because prom's going on right now, but, but saying, Hey, do you mind if I just come in? This is an idea I have. This is the, the piece I have. Can I talk to you about some different options for flowers and they also might be able to suggest like cost effective ones if you're looking for roses go to costco you can buy like thank you Janine. 100 for 50 dollars. thank you thank you are are there any other questions i see one in the back a couple in the back do we have a microphone it's coming well the microphone's going back i'm going to ask just a, a hands uh, up kind of thing how many people make their arrangements in their home and bring them to the museum that's, I see, is that three hands up? I, higher, I can't count. <laughs> okay, you may, okay. How many people build their uh, arrangements in the museum when they get here? I got, is that three or two? Two, Th four, okay. You got it, okay, well, thank you. Okay, okay, Hi, question. My question kind of follows that line actually for Sarah because um, you had a very large piece 
And part of floral designing is seems like it's somewhat engineering as well. And so I'm wondering how you were able to make that piece so tall. And also you just said that you did it at home because I don't know if I could do my, my piece at home this year because it's you know, big. And can you tell us a little bit more about that process? Yeah, well, so I actually make um, my pieces at work. So, but I do make them beforehand and then bring them to the museum. Um, but as far as like keeping them tall, so the Oasis was a big part. Um, I used a lot of pussy willow in it and I got really large branches so that I could make sure that I got the height that I wanted. Um, I did use some adhesive, just like some um, U glue strips to hold some flowers up. Um, I even tubed a couple of the flowers that weren't long enough to reach into the oasis. Um, but yeah, the oasis, I mean, it just really makes a difference. And then just keeping stems as long as possible just to get that height. But yeah, and I had to be particular, like there's certain flowers that you know, we would get in at Bachman's that I know that I would only be able to keep lower. So, so Oasis, it's a green foam that um, florists will use as opposed to using, let's say you have a vase with water, which is your typical arrangement that you're going to have, um, which I think a lot of artists um, use just in the regular vase, but the Oasis, you soak it in, so we have a tub of water, and then you put this smushy foam into it and it soaks in water. So instead of having the vase of water, you have foam. And so when you stick the stems into the Oasis, it really holds it still. So if you see um, funeral pieces, um, you're gonna see like the standing sprays or, um, pedestal pieces that are very structured um, and go out, those are usually typically done in Oasis. So, but yeah, that really made a difference as far as keeping it. Cause then I also like with a vase, you might have a taller vase. So, you know, your stem is taking up the whole bottom of the vase and then you need the height with the taller stem. With Oasis, you know, I don't have to push the stem all the way down to the bottom of the vase, I can adjust where exactly I want the height of my bloom or flower, whatever I'm using. Thank you, maybe. Sarah. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Uh, oh yes, there's I a hand. I just saw some hands up in the audience. And the microphone, well, all, the microphone is getting there. I'm, I'm gonna ask a question while the microphone, uh, this is for hands up. Has anyone been busted or asked by the committee or Mia to remove something? from their arrangement that it's not appropriate. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Can you share with us what that was? Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, I last year because my on setup day, my vase actually snapped in half at the base of it. And I had a dime sized hole at the bottom of it. Um, I had to use uh, hot glue, floral wire, whole lot of inspiration and support from Amanda and <laughs> blood, sweat, tears to make some sort of a kind of very questionable plug at the bottom of it to, and then tr because it was so slender at the bottom, hold it together so that it would still stay standing because it was top heavy. But um, okay, that's my, a terrible thing. A water yeah, leak. Yeah, my, mine was a water leak. <laughs> yeah. So um, we ended up folding up because it kind of has a little bit of a space underneath the base of it. We folded up a paper towel and made a little diaper. Okay, <laughs> a creative. Okay, let's have our question from the audience. Okay, uh, my question is for Kat. You mentioned that when your flowers drooped, you laid them in your kitchen sink or put them in your kitchen sink to restore them. How can you do that? I want to learn about that. Well, that, that's really interesting because um, you can do it with roses also. My mother decided I was quite the magi magician when her roses that she got, the heads dropped. And I knew exactly what was wrong. And first of all, you cut your stems at an angle 
not at a blunt end because at an angle, the stem collects up more water. And then you lay them in lukewarm water and, the, and I did in my kitchen sink, lay them in lukewarm water. The same thing I did with the hydrangeas. I had cut them at an angle and I just put them in lukewarm water. It took a few hours, but they did revive. Thank you, Kat. I, I think that's very interesting. That question came from Cootsie. I know Cootsie. Yeah, flowers drink water through their petals as well as the stem. So if you submerge your flowers in water, they will bring in water through the petals and the stem. Okay, another, I see a hand up. Is the microphone here? It's getting there, great. I just have a real quick request. I'm one of the guides that will be doing tours of the flowers. And if you want people to see your works, especially if they're made at home, find one of us on Wednesday and tell us about your, your arrangement. Because the more we know, the more we can share with people and the more people that will see your arrangements. So that's my, my ask. Thank you. Is there another hand up? Um, i just like to know how far in advance do you get your final work that you're going to be using in the year? How much lead time? Two, two months, two or two and a half months. Ah. I just also could add that um, uh, one time I had chosen my piece and it was an abstract painting, big uh, many pieces of design and I always make a fuse glass vase vessel and they take 14 hours of firing in a kiln up to 1400 degrees and then cooling it back down and preparing for the show you start early with those this year I'm going home today to open my kiln and see the front piece and see hoping it turned out great but three weeks before the show that one year, they pulled my piece from the show. And they say that in the directions that, uh, or the information that comes out, that that's a possibility. But of course, you never think it's going to happen. And I'm thinking three weeks before the show, why can't the curators just wait? Sorry, curators, but <laughs> why can't you just wait three weeks and then pull the painting? But I did have to start all over three weeks before, and I made another fused glass vase that had four panels of woodcut um, Japanese prints. And... Uh, it was in a brand new area of the museum. I was the only one in there because it was opened up just brand new. So nobody really found my piece very well. <laughs> the, the light was on the woodblock prints and my piece is over here in the dark shadows. <laughs> so that was my most fun year. <laughs> Thank you. It does happen. Okay. Do we have time for another question in the audience? Oh, I see a couple hands up. Like... <laughs> Yeah. Hi, I'm Lynn, and I'll be one of the people going around talking to you about your art and then conveying that in our training to our guides. And, you know, if you could just be thinking, going along with what she said, of just capsula, capsulizing, um, capturing what inspired you so that we can have that to convey as we talk. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be 20 words or less, but, you know, something that really sparks people because your audience wants to know that. I okay. want to comment on the docents. The docents are probably close to most pre important people um, in Art and Bloom in the whole, I mean, just a tour by the docents. I've learned so much from you. And I thank you for stopping by and asking us so that you can relay our thoughts to the public. Thank you. Thank you. I have time for one more question. Up here in the third row. I got the microphone. Oh, okay, okay, good, good, okay. Hi, I, Robin. <laughs> I don't have a question, I have a suggestion. After being exposed today to some of the behind the scenes parts of Art and Bloom, it's it gets me so excited for 
next week. And my suggestion is that everyone in this room, if you're not a member of the Friends, it would be really great to have you join so that you can be as much a part of Art and Bloom as these fabulous, talented people. Oh, thank you, Robin. Okay, one more. There was one in the third row. This will be the last question. Kind of in line with when do you um, find out your artwork, but when do you hear about the artworks and make your however many prioritized selections? Yeah. It, it, um, it really depends on the curators. I know Di Diane is very, very uh, patient and very, she's very, 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 very good about communicating. And I've heard from many veteran PFAs that um, Diane has been such a blessing with how well she communicates to us PFA on what's going on behind the scenes so that we're always kind of in the loop, but it's really to the mercy of having the curators curate all of those. Last year, it was earlier January. This year, it was end of January, closer to February. And I have to add, I'm going to embarrass Diane because I received an email from her one evening at 10 p.m. <laughs> And so, since I'm retired, I responded to her, go to bed, Diane, get some sleep. <laughs> Thank you, Kat. Okay, I have, I have a question, final question for all of the panelists. Um, it's a great privilege to bring an artwork and art creation into a museum like Mia and have it displayed on a pedestal. And Mia makes beautiful labels for all of these. They are the same labels they make for Rembrandt and Van Gogh. Um, I'm wondering if if you have saved these, if you've saved your labels or maybe even framed them. Hand, show of hands. Yeah, the plaques. Oh, yeah. The plaques. OK. OK. Yeah, this year. OK. Well, thank you, panelists. I know we've learned so much from them. And thank you all for coming. Art and Bloom starts two weeks from today. So I hope to see you there. Thank you.